I'm super excited to be here with Lucas Gilbreth, a pitcher uh, reliever in the Colorado for the Colorado Rockies. Uh, Lucas, how's it going, man? Good. How about yourself? Man, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's uh, it's been a busy couple of weeks here, you know, holidays and all that kind of stuff. Uh, before we just jump in, like, how were your holidays? Like, did you do anything uh, for Christmas? Like, do you guys have any like cool traditions or anything like that? Yeah, they were good. Honestly, uh, we didn't have, we don't have a ton of cool traditions. This was the first year I did my own uh, prime rib, so uh, oh, nice. I got to do that. I got a smoker and I did that whole thing. So that was a fun adventure. I've been enjoying that, but pretty low key on my end. How about yourself? It was good. Um, oh, my uh, my baby got sick the day after Christmas, oh, so it was it was perfect timing in a way since it was like the the Monday after. Um, so I was like, all right, it wasn't on Christmas Day, but Christmas Day was great. Um, we, we're, my, we're Mexican, so my wife and her family they make a ton of tamales. Oh, very so like I don't know if you've had tamales before, but oh, like yeah. we, I I can't even count how many I I, I uh, knocked out in that in that <laughs> those couple of days there. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. No, for sure, for sure. So how has how has your off season been? I mean, uh, is it pretty similar to like your previous off seasons, or, and everything's kind of the same? Do you have like a routine? Like how how's your off season been for you? Yeah, so this off season's been a little funky. Um, I missed the end of the year with a little elbow thing, so I've been kind of working back to that. But um, it's busier than it's always busier than I'd like. But I guess that's how I like it because I end up doing it to myself every year. So um, I kind of I work out six days a week. I go to Coors Field twice a week. Go to my own facility twice a week and then I go to either Lifetime or whatever public gym and then my facility twice a week so I kind of bounce around and then kind of mess around um doing some stuff on social media and then um working at my facility kind of hanging out with the college guys there in town this time of year and working with some of those guys so I try to keep myself busy and I think sometimes I do too good of a job of it but I enjoy it yeah, we'll talk about content in a second because you've been like pumping out like daily. I see you you're pumping out content <laughs> and stuff, and I can't wait to talk to you about that. But you, you mentioned that you go to Coors Field. Like, how sick is that that you live so close that you can just go there during the off season and like work out there? Oh, it's awesome. I mean, the obviously the facilities are state of the art. Um, it's kind of nice to just. It's funny to go in there when there's nobody there. It's so laid back and just running on the field when there's nobody there. It's wide open. I I enjoy it and being able to go in the weight room and use all of the assets and stuff they have there. It's it's just, it's a blessing to be honest with you, but um, it's, it's nice to be able to go down there and I'm lucky that I'm close enough to do it. Are there, are there any other guys who work out there or is it pretty much just you? This year was just me. Um, Marquez comes by, Herman Marquez comes by time to time. Um, He kind of splits between Venezuela and Denver, Um, mostly Venezuela because it's too cold for him here, which fair enough. Um, and then we just signed Pierce Johnson, who's a Colorado guy. So I think he may come by a couple times. But um, a lot of guys have kind of the places that they go and they're setting that. But I, I do really enjoy I like the staff we have at the field. So I like going in there and working with them and kind of chatting with them, too. Yeah. And you talk about like the, the weather and stuff. Colorado, it's it's funny because like most guys go to like California, Texas, Florida during the off season, But you're right there in the in the mountains and it's snowing and all that stuff like. Um, I guess you have all the inside gyms to work out at, but the yeah. Guys, and and honestly, probably... at the same time, don't tell anybody this because there's too people, right. too many people moving here already. But <laughs> um, it stays pretty nice here for the most part in the winter. I mean, you'll have a couple weeks here and there that get cold, and then you'll have a whole week where it's 60 degrees. So oh, nice. Um, the winters are not too bad here. You'll get it's it's pretty sporadic, but I've been able to throw outside every couple weeks here when I want to. It's like I think even next week it'll be may not quite be warm enough but next week it'll be close to 50 here so it, it gets decent in the winter Mo- yeah. most of the real cold stuff comes in february right when i take off oh okay and, and at that point you're already heading to to arizona yeah oh no yeah arizona you guys go to arizona for your spring training and stuff right on um so let's let's talk about you growing up and stuff and like you obviously grew up in colorado uh where does the story of you know you as a baseball player start yeah, so I always grew up going to Rockies games, playing baseball. Um, strangely enough, baseball was never my favorite sport. So what for was any your kids that hear this, it's it's all about balance. But I loved yeah. hockey. Hockey was my thing. Interesting. I loved – I played from the time I was like four to like 13 or 14 or whatever. I played like 10 years. So um, I got to experience that. Hockey is probably, in my opinion, the most demanding sport there is. Um, the ice time at 4 a.m., and then wow. the workouts after school and as an elementary schooler, it's a lot for kids, but yeah. um, that was always the thing I loved. And then I got to about middle school and 
um, I kind of, I got burnt out, honestly. And so that's when I had been playing baseball the whole time, but that's when I kind of started focusing more on baseball. And then my freshman year of high school is when I really, I had a coach sit me down as my high school coach, Ty Giordano sat me down. He's like, you need to focus on baseball because I was still trying to do what every kid tries to do. I was trying to play basketball and football and baseball. And I do strongly believe in that and being a multi-sport athlete, but he said, you do really need to spend some time trying to play baseball and trying to get better. And, you know, fortunately between my parents and him, we kind of listened to his advice and by um, my junior year, I was only baseball, but even my sophomore year, I started really focusing on baseball and doing lessons. And uh, I played for the Rocky scout team. So that's when I kind of really figured out like, Oh, baseball might be my thing. So mm -hmm. um, I didn't realize that I had talent, I guess, until probably like sophomore fall or high school. And I went and played on the Rocky scout team and mm -hmm. me and David Peterson, who's a starting pitcher for the Mets were on the same team. And we were the only sophomores. Nice. We got to go to those cool showcases and he and I played together and, all of a sudden we realized like, wait, all these guys we're playing against are getting drafted and going to division one schools and yeah. we're sophomores. This is crazy. So um, that's when it kind of became real. And I started talking to schools and getting some offers. And um, that's when I started talking to university of Minnesota. Um, as you know, Colorado is cold weather state, not necessarily known for baseball. So it's hard to mm -hmm. find somewhere to play. Whereas like a place like California, there's obviously a ton of schools. Colorado has, I think technically two division one schools. Um, one of them's air force, which I, I went on a visit, but it just wasn't for me. Those guys have a special gift and to be able to do yeah. that, I wish I was strong enough to do that. Um, and then Northern Colorado and Greeley. So it, it's really hard to want to stay in the state. So yeah. Minnesota ended up being a good fit for me and I was able to go there for three years prior to pro Bowl. What other what other schools were you interested? In? I mean, outside of Colorado, you mentioned the two there. Like, were there any other like Big Ten? Like, you know, it's not it's a pretty big deal. You know, Big Ten schools and stuff. Yeah, I talked to uh, Nebraska was one of the first ones. Um, I mm -hmm. talked to NC State and the ACC. I talked to UC Santa Barbara, um, Tennessee, Oklahoma, but Minnesota was kind of the best of the both worlds for me because a school like Oklahoma, for example, the facilities are awesome, the competition's incredible, but you start getting worried about, am I going to play? Are they going to take time to develop me? All that kind of stuff. Um, and then the school like UC Santa Barbara is in a great spot, good school, but at the same time, you don't get the big football atmosphere, the football money, the football facilities, mm -hmm. all that cool stuff, right? So Minnesota for me was perfect because I felt like the staff was really focused on development. They had a really strong track record of sending guys to the big leagues. And then on top of everything else, I love the campus. I love the facilities. And even the academic side made sense for me. What was your major? I wanted to do engineering. So I think I switched engineering majors like five times. But um, towards the end, it was like biomedical engineering. And I, the last classes I took were all software engineering related. So I've bounced around quite a bit. But I do enjoy engineering as a whole. It's just kind of figuring out what exactly I want to do. Yeah. Do you think that kind of helps you as a pitcher? Like, I mean, like you sort of kind of like, this dice and maybe it's just my dumb non-engineering brain thinking but you're like just dissecting like the pitches and oh stuff. No. i think it, i like to say it's like my greatest asset and my biggest downfall at the same time because i've been known and i've been told that i overthink right so for me sometimes it's like i'm trying to optimize my mechanics optimize my pitches that stuff all makes sense to me i'm always mm -hmm. working to make everything as an engineer guys work their whole lives to make something one percent better right so for my brain, it just makes sense to like, oh, if my slider gets this much better every day, it's going to be really, really good. So that part's great. Now, I've had to kind of separate that from what I do on the mound. And that's been a transition because once you're out there and you're on the mound, there's no analytical side. The more analytical you get, the harder it's going to be to compete and get guys out. So that's what I've had to learn along the way. But I would say, yes, it's helped my development, you know significantly and without it i can't say i'd really be here yeah are you like you talk about analytics and stuff um are the rockies and the organization pretty analytical because i know some teams focus heavily on it some teams are not so heavy on it uh, where do they, like the rockies stand when it comes to, like, i'd say we're kind of a middle ground team i think we're putting more and more of an emphasis on it especially with um coors field i mean coors field's <laughs> its own beast pitching in denver is its own beast so I think it's been taboo for years and years to talk about it. Nobody wants to hear, you know, oh, altitude, Denver, dry air, all that. But 
I think it's getting to the point where we're starting to realize, okay, there's something to this. How do we create, you know, how do we look into analytics that are going to help us and give us an advantage at Coors, not just survive there? Mm -hmm. Do you think you, do you, you talk about Coors effect? Do you feel like you have an advantage pitching there versus like other teams who come in to pitch there or not? Yeah, I would absolutely argue we have an advantage. I mean, um, I talked to Daniel Bard about it quite a bit. He's pretty analytical mm -hmm. in that sense. And us knowing how our stuff moves, what it does, how to pitch, how to attack hitters at home. I think it is an advantage and I think that's the right perspective to look at it and the right light to look at it in because we're the only ones that play half our games there. Now, right. is there something to be said for the ball flying farther and pitches moving less? Yes, but we know that going in. So for us to be able to know, okay, my slider is going to break less, my fastball, I have to command better. That's an advantage because I'm not trying to throw the wipeout nastiest slider I've ever seen. I'm trying to locate a slider to get weak contact or maybe a swing and miss. So that's one of the things I think it's an advantage for us. And if guys can buy into that approach, I think it's a huge advantage because, you know, teams come in and they're not used to that. They're used to sea level. They're used to humidity, all that. So it is a game changer. Do you think, do you feel, think like um, other pitchers who come there maybe overcompensate? Like they think, okay, I got to throw like extra harder or I got to throw my slider a specific way. And that kind of um, is because you talked about how like you kind of already have that pre that idea in your head that you don't have to do that. Do you think other teams or other pitchers oh, kind of, yeah. I think so, for sure. I think, okay. you know, you see a lot of pitchers in interviews like, oh, I think Madison Baumgartner said he was pitching on the moon or something, right? Jeez. So I think some guys do get in their heads about it in the sense of like, oh, I have to do, I have to be special or I have to be mm -hmm. different or I have to figure out, you know, how do I make my stuff better? And that's, that's where you get into trouble is if you try to throw harder, if you try to make that slider nastier, I've learned the hard way, it's going to move less. I've, I've thrown yeah. O2 sliders that I'm like, Oh, I'm gonna bury this one. It's gonna be the nastiest slider Machado's ever seen. And next thing you know, it's just a spinner, and he puts it on the concourse. So you learn that lesson the hard way there. But it, it's important, and I think some guys, especially from other teams, when you see that slider not really move, you can either a just try and locate it better, or b you try to make it move more, and that's where guys get in huge trouble. Yeah, that's 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 good perspective. I mean, because I've always been curious about like the because you hear the core's effect, like that term thrown around. So it's interesting to hear your perspective on that. Um, talking about the Big Ten, how was it playing in the Big Ten? Obviously, you talk about the football. Like, how were like game days? Like, did you guys have practices on those days, or did the coach, uh, you know, so you guys didn't get too maybe too crazy the night before and stuff like that? But uh, how was that? Oh, he was pretty good. So like our big thing was like we always practice on Sundays, which um, we're kind of meant you know you're not going to go crazy on Saturday, but. Mm -hmm. I love college football and I love the Big Ten's obviously Big Ten versus SEC. There's always a debate, but to me, Big Ten's the most historic conference in mm -hmm. college football. You have rivalries that have been around, you know, 150 years almost. So um, getting to go to all those schools, I always tried to go into the football stadiums. That was one of my big things when we went to different schools was going to their football stadium after our series. But the tailgating's awesome. The atmosphere is always cool. It's always great, you know. Minnesota was okay when I was there. They're better now, but, you know, being able to have all that excitement, all that hype when you play in Ohio State and, you know, you act like it's like our Super Bowl, right? And it gets mm -hmm. crazy and there's a ton of people. And then you talk about Minnesota versus Wisconsin or Minnesota versus Iowa, all those little rivalries, um, Floyd of Rosedale, all the fun little trophies and stuff. That, that was a kick and it was awesome. On the, on the baseball side, because Madison doesn't have a baseball team. I wish they did. Um, who who were you guys' biggest rivalries? Because I know football, they had like the the axe game. Uh, yeah. Was it the axe game? Yeah, yeah. So what yeah. did so, yeah. your guys' biggest Ours rivalry? Ours would have been Iowa because okay. Iowa is one of our big rivals too. But honestly, personally, it would probably be Purdue. Strangely enough, but just because that... they they played spoiler for us two of my three uh... years, like stupid. Like they, I think my junior year, they, <laughs> this is credit to them. They won the games, but they weren't very good. And yeah. we needed to win one game to win the Big Ten, and they swept us. And just Jeez. in the grittiest, nastiest games, they're bunting, they're slashing, guys are taking the extra base, guys are laying out. Like, good, it was awesome. Good for them. Yeah, but yeah like, I hate this school. <laughs> um, who, who was maybe the school that you love to face then? Like, you were just like, all right, maybe their fans are a little cocky, and you're like, I just can't yeah. wait to shove. I always loved Michigan. Michigan's a great one. Um, yeah. And, uh, Ohio State was always good, too. Um, Ohio State has a sweet park. Their fans are a little rowdy. <laughs> Nebraska, to their credit, like, fans were really rowdy, but they're good baseball fans. So that was a fun place to pitch because mm -hmm. 
if you threw really well on Friday, Saturday, well, during BP, somebody would come up and be like, hey, great job yesterday. You looked really good. Like, too bad we couldn't pull it out, but we'll get you guys tonight. And it, it's cool. That's the cool stuff of baseball. Yeah, no, that's awesome. At what point um, – you talk, when did you commit to Minnesota, actually? When did I you committed commit? – it would have been my junior year. So okay. 2013. There's so many kids nowadays like committing like high school, like freshmen. So it's crazy oh, yeah. like how insane it's getting now. Oh, and I like so like sophomore year, I got a few offers like Nebraska and some other schools. And it was like, a, hey, we need you to decide in, you know, 48 <laughs> hours or whatever. Yeah. I'm, I'm 15 years old. I don't know what I'm eating for dinner tonight. How am I supposed to decide, you know, the path of the rest yeah. of my life? It's crazy. I don't I feel bad for these kids. Yeah, that's yeah, you're right. It, it's hard to make the decision, especially with the pressure from parents, from peers, from like um, scouts and all that kind of stuff. Um, what, what what advice would you give for them maybe for younger kids who are in that age range who are thinking because obviously you felt, felt that pressure yourself? Yeah, the biggest thing and it's easier said than done is not to press right because at the end of the day, baseball is one of the coolest sports in the sense that you don't yeah. have to be freakishly big, freakishly tall, freakishly fast you know, freakishly gifted to play mm -hmm. at the next level. Baseball is a cool game because if you focus on the little things, if you do what you're capable of, schools will find you and you'll get opportunities, whether that's at the division two level, the division one level, the junior college level, they're going to find you. And the cool thing too, is you can play in the MLB from any of those divisions, right? I've played with mm -hmm. guys that went to D three schools. I've played with guys that were the top prospects in the sec. I've played with high school draft picks and everything in between. So it's the big thing for these kids is don't stress. Everybody develops differently. Everybody develops at a different time. So the more pressure you put on yourself, the worst spot you're probably going to put yourself in. Yeah, no, that's very well said. Um, so when did you finally realize that you, you know, dr the draft was a, like a, a, a actual moment for you? Like, when did you, when was that if to when were you stopped saying if I get drafted and started saying when I get drafted? Yeah. So out of high school, I think I went in the 36th round or right. something to the Rockies and like, I had one, I think the Blue Jays came to my house and met with me and talked about money or whatever. And as a high school, what my goals were at a high school. Yeah. Okay. And what my goals were. And I was pretty dead set on going to college, which was good because I wanted to go to school and mm -hmm. um, talk to the Rockies, kind of same conversation. So I, I got drafted as kind of a courtesy. And then in college, right before um, the draft, my junior year. So it would have been like all winter leading into my junior year, I think I met with every single big league team and either some of them two or three times. And that's when I was like, Oh my gosh, like I yeah. had to get an agent. And I was like, wow, I, I'm, I think I'm definitely going to get drafted. So um, that was, that's when it kind of became real. When I was like, I had meetings lined up in a row or it'd be like, Oh, I meet with the blue Jays. And then right after was the Indians and right after was the Orioles or whatever. And you know, all those guys know each other. So they're fine. Mm -hmm. But, that was when I was kind of like, holy cow, like I might actually be able to do this. Yeah. Did you have a draft party? Uh, i not really, to be honest with you. I had my wife over, or it was my girlfriend at the time, I guess, but we were just at my parents' house. I didn't want to do anything. I was, I was stressed. So like my compensation was, I was like, I'm going fishing. And they're like, no, you can't do that. And I was like, I'm doing it. So like, yeah. I thought I was going to go in like the third round. And I got a lot of calls and I thought it was kind of a done deal. And after I didn't go in the third, I got, I started getting really stressed. So okay. I was like, I'm going fishing. So I left for a little bit and got that over with. And then the Rockies ended up taking me a few rounds later. But yeah, I was somebody that was like, I don't want the pressure. I don't want to deal mm -hmm. with this. I just want to go. Yeah, that's awesome. And you ended up getting drafted, you know, decently high, um, in a decent signing bonus what was that first like major purchase that you bought or maybe that first dumb purchase that you bought with your signing bonus oh man mine probably would have been i got a truck because like i've always wanted like i have a big black f-150 and um, i always wanted a truck because uh, i drove i had got an explorer when i was 15 or whatever and i drove that thing it's still kicking i think but i about drove that thing into the ground so Fortunately, my dad was there to help me. There was a couple trucks I looked at that I'm very glad I didn't buy because I shouldn't have, and they were too much and they were crazy. But um, that was probably my first big purchase. Nice. I've I've talked to guys who said they bought chains. One guy said he bought a mailman truck, or yes. mailman jeep. And I'm like, all these guys are, Holy you know, cow. yeah. It's it's funny what the different things that people die and like you know credit to you because I mean it's it's you earned that money and stuff. Um, so it's yeah, I mean might as well. Yeah, it's always a hard debate, right? Because like. I grew up, my dad's very like frugal and, mm -hmm. you know, it was like, well, 
you earned it. Do you buy something? Do you not buy something? And at the same time, I'm 21 years old. I'm not thinking, right. oh, I need to invest for retirement. You know, you do a little bit because you get good advice. Right. But yeah, right away, I'm like, I want to buy a big old truck and brand new Raptor, all this fun stuff. And then thankfully, I had some people in my life to help me tone it back a little bit. Like, yeah. All right pump the brakes so yeah it was good that's awesome how was the miners because i mean i love talking to guys hearing their stories and you know whether it's uh bed bugs in in the hotels blood in the hotels i've heard that mm -hmm. um do you have any like funny minor league stories yeah i think i always joke like i wish they'd do a hard knocks for minor league baseball but i don't That'd be epic. They could get away with it because the things they would see would be horrifying um it would shut down it would shut down minor day. leaguers yeah, we played like a double header in the Cali League. So it was high A. Um, in Lancaster, it's usually like 110 degrees and mm -hmm. windy every day. So it was a double header, 18 innings or whatever. Guys are dying. One of the games went into extra innings. It's crazy hot. There's nobody at the game. So everybody's gassed. We all get done. And we come in and somebody cuts into their chicken or whatever. And it is completely raw. Oh. Like, so raw that like it's not it's cold to the touch yeah and there's like four guys because it's like 11 30 at this point and in lancaster there's nothing open like it's not a very big city so yeah there's like four guys that are sitting there looking at these raw chicken breasts and they're like i might have to eat this and guys are like no don't eat it don't do it <laughs> and the guys are like no i'm seriously so hungry like i might have to so like i think one or two guys ate it and oh, ended up getting God. super sick but yeah, it was one of those, and you're just like, oh, we play. I think we played that day 19 or 20 innings total between the two double Jeez. Um That's insane. But yeah, that's a good food one. They've improved the food, I think, at least to their credit. Um, yeah. I do have, the bed bugs ones are always tough. I remember a guy went in, um, it was in rookie ball. We were in, I think, Idaho Falls, which that league doesn't even exist anymore, but. He went down, he went in his bed, there were bugs, and it was nasty, and he went to the front desk in this dinky little hotel and he, there he's like yeah i think i need a new room they have bed bugs and the lady at the front's like oh i'm sorry to hear that and we're like well are you gonna give him a new room or she's like uh i mean we don't have any room what do you want me to do and we're like oh so like, <laughs> it just was what it was and the poor guy slept yeah. in fully clothed with a sweatshirt on on top of the covers for the whole oh. weekend but it was fun i mean that's yeah that's what you learn a lot of stuff. And, you know, I, even when I talk to high school kids that are looking into the draft and all that stuff, I'm kind of like, look, like college is awesome. The way you get treated at a division one school is unmatched until you get to like probably triple A. So yeah, take advantage of that. Learn, you know, learn that, enjoy that path, enjoy the college. And then their minor league ball will be there when it's there. Um, don't yeah. force it. Cause you know, it's not, it's not the best thing in the world. obviously. <laughs> it isn't it isn't and like the minor leagues uh minor league teams are in always or a lot of them are in like small little rural towns where they don't have a ton of things i've been to lancaster i actually grew up in california um in yeah. the bay area but I, i've been up there to lancaster and, and it's hot there's nothing out there um i remember looking for food i think it ended up going to like a panda express um <laughs> and stuff like, that. But like it's it is just it's the middle of nowhere um so yeah i i I feel, I feel you there playing there but what was maybe one city you went to where you're like where am I? I'm in the middle of nowhere. Oh, yeah. So that's, uh, I'm trying to think. The Cali League, um, Modesto is kind of cool, actually, but on the way there, Visalia was probably the one that we were driving through Visalia. I was just kind of like, oh my gosh, like, where are we? Um, that one, that one was, that one was a tough one for me because, um, the Sally League or the Cali League, like, up north is great. San Jose is great. Um, mm -hmm. Even Stockton, it's not in a great city, but it's a cool stadium and there's stuff to do there. But yeah, that was probably the one. Visalia was the one where, like, I think they told us at the hotel, like, hey, you know, stay at the hotel, don't go anywhere, <laughs> get on the bus, go to the field, get back, kind of deal. And you know, which was fair. I, I think yeah. there's a lot of dangerous cities we played in in that league, which it, it is what it is. Some of them are really cool stadiums with really cool fans, so I can't say too much bad stuff about them. Yeah. So how was that moment then when you get your call up? Because you got called up in 2020, right? Yes. Or yeah. I got put on the roster in 2020 and then called up in 2021. Were you like on the taxi squad for or like the, the for in 2020 or, or no? Uh, no. So that's a that's a really fun one. So basically in 2020, I really kind of thought and hoped I would get an invite 
to be to the alt site and to yeah you know work out and i didn't get it which was fine and then i even went as far as like calling the farm director because i'm like hey i'm 20 minutes away i live 20 minutes from the field mm-hmm. like i'm sure you need arms to throw can i just come throw like please just let me come throw and, and they said and no i said no no and so that's the that summer i wasn't at the alt site i was at this facility working out every morning at 6 a.m. because they let me come in, even though COVID closed everything down. So eventually I started getting close to 100 miles an hour and I reached out to Frank Gonzalez, who was the double A pitching coach at the time. And he's from Colorado too. And I was like, hey, can you come out for a weekend and just watch me throw or come up? And he's like, yeah. So he watched me and I think in the bullpen I threw, I was like 98 to 100 or something. Nice. And so he finally like vouched for me and, you know, they tried to get me to the offset at the end and didn't end up getting me there because that's mm-hmm. it's one guy or another was like, Oh, it's too late. End of the year. Who cares? So I ended up going to instructs, which for me was like uh, the fall league. Cause there's no fall league that year. So mm-hmm. it was a weird mix of like guys like me who would have been Arizona fall league candidates. And then 18 year old, um, Latin players or 18 year old American players who was their first year they just got drafted mm-hmm. so I ended up I didn't even get invited to that I got invited because somebody got kicked out for doing something oh, so I was like a reserve and so I go there and I think I ended up throwing I think I threw 13 innings and I ended up I gave up one hit the mm-hmm. whole time so I, I ended up pitching well my velocity I was upper 90s the whole time and then they were like holy cow so they put me on the roster at the end of that fall. So then going into 2021, I was on the roster. I got an invite to big league camp, obviously. And then I debuted, I debuted in the big leagues before I had played above high A technically. Yeah. I, I, I saw that. Cause you skipped double A and triple A and then you got sent back down to triple A. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think I made, I ended up making my triple A debut about a month after my big league debut. That's crazy. So when you get back to the to Triple A, are, are these guys looking at you like this dude? Like he skipped Double A, he skipped Triple A, he's going straight to the majors. Yeah, and like honestly, I don't think any of them have like harsh thoughts or right, right. Things, obviously, but I think some guys are like, "What the heck? Like you're so lucky. How'd you manage yeah. this?" You know, going back down the first time. I mean, I was so happy to be in Triple A. I still had buddies that went to Double A after missing that whole yeah. season. So like, oh, this is cool. And, I got to work on stuff and then I ended up spending almost the whole year in the big leagues in 21 and then spent the whole year in 2022 basically so it was like kind of it was fast but yeah and then on top of it it was my first year being a reliever so I it was there's a lot of transitioning going on but I, I mean I I got lucky and I was in a good spot and yeah fortunately I was able to do it um you talked about throwing hard and it kind of got you like you were telling them hey I'm hitting triple digits now um everybody wants to throw hard every every kid wants to hit with the high velocity um what what kind of went into you gaining that velocity and like what advice would you give to guys who are trying to throw harder yeah this is kind of a strange piece of advice but i'm a strange Mm -hmm. person but my recommendation is to try crazy things and that's the most vague thing i can say but i can't necessarily i was talking to somebody about a couple days ago uh, one of the college guys that works out at my facility but it's like, I can't attribute it to one thing, right? Everybody's always looking for one fix, but right. I completely changed how I was lifting. I completely revamped my mechanics and then I completely revamped my mental side and my intent, which, you know, it sounds kind of crazy, but I always talk about you prepare the body to throw a hundred and not vice versa. Mm-hmm. You don't throw a hundred and then have your body handle. It's just not going to work that way. So I, I, ended up doing some crazy and I don't recommend this unless you're seeing a real professional, but I was doing like snatches and clean and jerks, like full Olympic style lifting because I got to the point where I was like, I got crazy strong during the COVID stuff. I think I hit the 1500 pound club for lifting, which is squat bench and deadlift. I got over. So that was a big goal. And then I still wasn't throwing any harder. So I was desperate at this point. And I was like, I'm going to do Olympic lifting. So I went through and I got trained by people that knew what they were doing and went through the whole progression. And then um, everything started to kind of click together and I trusted it and I never abandoned it. And all of a sudden every week it'd be like, Oh, I got another mile an hour and another mile an hour and then 1.2. And then eventually I got there. But my, the big advice for me is like, you never know what's going to get you there. And 
mm-hmm. you know, back to even the content stuff, I try and give little stuff because there are certain things that contribute to velocity and people that throw hard do some similar things, but you never know what little thing is going to push you over the edge to that next two mile an hour or five mile an hour jump or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. No, that's, that's good advice. And like you talked about content and you put out a lot of good content. Uh, what got you started into that? I mean, because obviously um, it's, I mean, on, being on the content side, it's not always easy because you got to be consistent and stuff like that. But like, what kind of put that in your mindset? Like, you know, I'm just just start pumping out content. Yeah, no, that was a, it's a hard one, right? And, you know, as somebody that does it, like, yeah, I, I got to the point where I felt like it was lazy of me not to put out content, I guess is where I got. Because I worked out um, with Trevor Bauer and at the Watch Momentum facility um, in 2021 during the lockout. And all those guys are all content driven, right? And yeah. that's all they do. And, you know, I kind of looked at it and I was like, eh, you know, I, I don't really want to do that. And then I got to the point where I was like, you know, I have a lot of stuff. I talk to a lot of kids. I have a facility where I run into a lot of kids and like, I'm not really reaching as many kids as I probably could or should. So I felt like I had a, to an extent, a moral obligation to Mm -hmm. reach out to more people and give out, you know, advice that I've gotten over the years and things that have helped me because, you know, some kids never get that advice. And so being able to help them, I mean, even on the content side, like I try and post, I think my recipe or whatever I try and do is like three informative and two funny or trends a week because I want to help kids. And as you know, sometimes those videos don't do as good, but at the same time, it's like, that's morally what I'm trying to do is help. And then if I can, you know, gain some followers and help more people by posting trends and funny stuff, great. But yeah, for me, it it, it was weird. Like one day I was just sitting there and I was like, for whatever reason, it was like weighing on me. And I was like, I feel like I have an obligation to try and help some people like I was helped out. And it, it's gotten, I've started, I think I've posted every day now for like three weeks. So it's not fun, but I, I do it. Yeah. And like you get, you, you, the funny thing that I saw that I really enjoyed was you were posting mean tweets <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that people yes. have, have messaged you. And it's, I think it's funny because I don't think fans really realize that you guys do see those. And uh, oh, yeah. I'm sure I'm sure you've had like what is the maybe the funniest DM you've got and maybe you lost somebody money or something now that betting's legal and stuff. Oh yeah, there's been guys that are like, I lost my last two hundred dollars. I can't even eat tonight. And some of them <laughs> I'll reply to. I'm like, dude, that was a st- stupid decision. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, I know. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, why'd you even tell me that? Like, one, I I'm never trying to lose a game, which cracks me up. And then two, it's right. like. I'm like, why'd you bet your last 200 bucks? Like, now I kind of feel bad for you, aside from my pitching performance. That's some yeah. poor financial decisions on their part. Yeah, and some people will be like, I had the over in hits, and you gave up a hit. And I'm like, I gave up a bunt single in the seventh inning. Like, how is this my fault? Yeah. But, you know, it's pretty funny. I mean, a lot of them, there's some horrible ones, obviously. There's always going to be horrible people. Yeah. Some of them are really funny, and I get a kick out of them. Because, you know, as a reliever especially, you have to have a short memory, and a lot of yeah. times I'm harder on myself than anybody in my DMs could be anyway. So by the next day, I'll be laughing about it. Yeah. What does your wife think about that? Like the content, like what was her thoughts when you say, you know, I'm going to start putting oh, out she's some content. Been, she's been awesome. She's helped me so much along the way. And I've been trying to get her to post stuff on her own, but she was the one that kind of helped me get into it. And she started helping me make videos and she recorded me doing stuff and She's been huge because uh, she's friends with really good friends with Austin Gomber's wife, Rachel Gomber, who is like a TikTok queen. I think she has, oh, wow. I don't know, half a million, a million followers, something crazy. Yeah. But she's really close with her. And she was like, you know, you should do it. So she's been awesome. And she helps me a ton. That's awesome. So getting, getting back to your major league debut, um, what was that first moment when you saw like, somebody wearing a jersey with your name on the back of it maybe it was your wife maybe it was family and friends like that but just seeing like someone in the stands with your name on the back of their of a jersey that they're wearing how how was that feeling oh it was crazy just seeing my whole family got jerseys and that was surreal to see taking a picture and then the craziest thing was that just seeing like random people that i've never met before like you know there's a couple of kids i've met that are like Oh, I'm from Colorado. I played in the little league that you played in, and he's wearing mm. your jersey. I was just, you know, I'm not a very emotional person, but sometimes I'm like, wow, like yeah. words can't even describe what that feels like and how lucky I am to have that opportunity. Yeah, I, I, I'll never, I'll never experience that, I guess. But uh, <laughs> no big deal. 
<laughs> but yeah, but no. you know what? <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to hype it up too much, but yeah, I'm so lucky. I I can't even explain. Yeah, so w- this is what I'll do. I'll I'll get I'll get you a shirt with the, the podcast logo on it. Yeah, and then uh, you can rock that in one of your 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 TikTok videos, and then I'll kind of feel hyped up. You know, I'll show yeah. my wife, be like, "Look, someone's rocking my shirt." <laughs> I will absolutely do that. I will absolutely. Do <laughs> All right. That. Well, I'm gonna have to get that set up, and I'll I'll send you one. I'll have to you know workshop one and, and get it to you. That'd be sick. Um, yeah, I love it. Yeah. So, uh, what advice would you have maybe for players like on the mental side of baseball? Because you you talked about like pitching some some part of it's mental. Um, and then you hear the guys in your DMs or whoever it is, fans in your DMs, like, how do you stay mentally strong? Uh, because you ha- give up a couple runs as a, re- a reliever. You got to go back out the next game or the next couple games and kind of just forget about everything. Absolutely. I think this last year, I actually had one of the hardest ones in my career. I think I blew two games in a row. And Jeez. then the third day, they are going to have me down. But I wanted to be up because, you know, I wanted to get back out there and get back yeah. on the bowl or whatever. Mm-hmm. And they said, okay, only an emergency. So I ended up coming in in that game against the Giants. It was the 10th inning. Um, it was a tie game at home against the heart of their lineup. And as you know, the runner starts on second. So it's right. like, crap, I just blew the last two games. I'm struggling. And I ended up getting through that. And I went strikeout, strikeout, ground out to get out of it. No runs. And we ended up winning the game. And it was like, holy cow. But that's the thing. Like I talk about having a short memory. I always joke, like, you never know when you're going to get a save or when you're going to get a hold mm-hmm. or whenever you're going to get an opportunity. So you could blow five in a row and you still might need to go out there and put up a zero to win the game, right? So having that short memory, and that's kind of a cliche term at this point, but short memory being it's a new day, I have a new inning, I have a new pitch, I have whatever, is, is just a real mindset to kind of take into getting better and staying out of that kind of gloomy – woe is me mentality out of the bullpen yeah um and like i said that's good good mindset to have especially as a reliever when you got to come out there you never you never know when you're going to come out there what do you do to get hyped up are you like a red bull guy uh um, pre-workout like i like what's your uh, (laughs) hype up kind of thing yeah i'm trying to lay off i'm trying to quit the red bulls but i was i'm a big red bull guy and then uh i was on smelling salts for a while because Nice. The, the smelling salts are one thing like I got to the point you want to replicate the same adrenaline day in and day out. Right. Right. And pitching on a Friday night in L.A. is very different than pitching a day game in Arizona on a Wednesday. Right. So trying to replicate that. I, you get to the point, though, at least I got to the point where it was like I get excited more than I get nervous to, hmm. to a sense. And I think I've almost tricked my brain into that where it's like. I'm warming up and I'm like getting excited to go in the game because yeah. you never know when you're going to go in the game. But I think I've tricked myself into thinking that you turn those nerves into like excited energy almost. That's awesome. Um, so when you made your major league debut, at what point, uh, maybe last year or even this year, at what point did you realize like, all right, I'm in the show? Like, what was that moment for you? Maybe it was the planes. Maybe it's like the the um, clubbies being so willing to help out, you know, the food, the spread. Like, what was that moment for you? Or like, dang, this is kind of nice. I think it was honestly my first flight um, back from Arizona because I debuted in Arizona. And you get on the plane and they have like Chick-fil-A chicken nuggets, which I love because <laughs> I love yeah. Chick-fil-A and I like eat those. And then one of the flight attendants comes up and she's like, oh, do you want to look at the menu? And I was like, all right. She's like, oh, I'll just take a peek. And on the menu, it was like steak and lobster mac and cheese. And I was like, Jeez. so of course I had to get that. So I'm like sitting yeah. there on the plane. I'm watching a movie with my little headphones on. And I was like, holy cow, like this is the dream right here. Yeah. You know, eating steak and lobster mac and cheese on a plane, hanging out with all these guys, looking at Charlie Blackman, 10 rows in front of me. I was like, wow. <laughs> This is unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, were there like card games going on? Like, like who, or who controlled yeah, the music? Guys like, played, who... I think guys play blackjack now. So guys are playing okay. blackjack a couple rows in front of me. Um, I think morale was good. I think we won that series. So that's always, you know, nice to be on the flight. Right. But yeah. It's, it, it's, it's obviously just such a cool experience. And I, I wish every kid would be able to experience it someday. Yeah. A lot of them will, you know, you yeah. never know. No, for sure. Yeah, you never know, and like, hopefully, you know, knock on wood, um, a lot of them get to experience that. Um, now that you're kind of a little bit more established, like, I mean, are you still kind of listening, watching a movie with the buds in, or like, are you kind of are you at the poker table? Like, uh, what are you doing? 
I haven't done the poker table. I've been, I've been too nervous. Those guys are crazy. But is it pretty um, high high stakes? Yeah, I think I don't even know what some. I don't even want to know what some of those guys bet. But I, I I'm pretty laid back. Um, we played uh I think Mario Kart for a little while on like the Nintendo Switch or whatever oh, nice. it is. Yeah. So you can like link them together without Wi-Fi or whatever. So we were mm-hmm. playing that for a while. Um, a lot of times I'll just chit chat with some of the guys about whatever, hanging out or golf, whatever we're talking about. But I do love my movies. I gotta be honest with you. I. That's my time. I don't really watch movies in the off season. I don't really watch movies at home, but yeah. on the planes, I'd be like, "Oh, there's a new movie. Gotta watch that one." That's awesome. What kind of movies are you into? Like action, horror, comedy, romance? I think I've watched anything at this point. Probably action would be my favorite. I like all the Marvel movies. I like the Lord of the Rings series. I like um, Star Wars. All any any of those action, yeah. Jack Reacher, all that stuff. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so you talk about black men. Like you guys had Brian on the team, Crone, a ton of good guys mm-hmm. on that last last year's roster, even this year upcoming roster. Um, who was maybe one guy you just looked around? Like it could be opposing teams. You're just like, dang, like that guy's that guy's a dog. Like or that guy's just insanely talented. Oh yeah, I mean you look at the Dodgers. Um, Mookie one through nine. Is a great example. <laughs> Trey Turner is a great example. Yeah. Um, and then the Padres playing those two teams is a joke um, all the time. Good, but it's cool. It's a cool opportunity at the same time. But yeah. Soto, Soto is one of the best. Machado is one of the best. Uh, Machado is one of the best or the high, highest touted players in baseball. And I still think he's underrated to an extent. Yeah. He's, he's just so, so, so talented. But Why do you think he's underrated? Because I, I, I completely agree with you. I think like people would say he's one of the best, but. He's always overshadowed by like, oh, Nolan Arenado is the best third baseman, or mm-hmm. Tatis is the best player on the Padres, and he's kind of for a guy that's is insanely talented as he is. Nobody talks about him to mm-hmm. an extent, and it's not even his fault. But I think especially as he's matured and he's older now, like he doesn't mm-hmm. ruffle feathers. He just right. goes out. He hits three hundred with a bunch of home runs, and he wins games. He always gets clutch hits. It's Consistent it's impressive. Too. I just don't think he gets talked about enough. Yeah. Have you, has Juan uh, Soto shuffled on you? No, no, he hasn't yet. I, I hung a slider to him last year and he dribbled a grounder down the line for a double, but um, I went right at him last time and I went fastball and like middle, middle and beat him on the first pitch, which he still ended up hitting a double the next pitch, but I was like, that's sweet. Yeah. Who, who's yeah, one guy that, we always joke about the we always joke about the shuffle. It's like, well, if he shuffles, don't throw that again. <laughs> yeah, I wonder what he's. Maybe he's trying to send a message. Like, do you think he's sending the message to the pitcher as he shuffles, or is it just like to the fans, or maybe it's just like a mental thing for him? It could be for him mentally himself. Yeah. It's kind of what I thought. Is like, like he's reset. like, I see that, I got that. Okay, just hyping himself up almost. Yeah, it works. Like that guy is so good, and he's so young Freak. too. Like, just looking looking at his nationals <laughs> when they won it's the World Series. To think about how young he is. Yeah, you'll be seeing him for a while. Who's the who's the maybe one guy who's giving like the hardest time? Like he's like, I cannot get this guy out. Oh, Josh Rojas, hands down. I for whatever reason, he hit a home run off me my first my major league debut. He's a lefty. I'm normally really good left on left, and for whatever reason, I can't get that guy out. So that's been that's been a focus this off season. I'm gonna try and level the playing field next year <laughs> it's to the point now where it's like i gotta do something about it it's no mm-hmm. longer just like yeah don't worry about it so yeah so the first time you strike him out i'm gonna send you a dm like hey man proud got of you. Him. <laughs> you, got him. Yeah. That's awesome. you got him maybe just like a smiley emoji i got or if you don't maybe <laughs> yes. just like the poop emoji yeah <laughs> like, you got you again dog <laughs> We'll see what we'll see what happens. What is your favorite city to visit? Let's maybe kind of talk about end on this. Like, what is your favorite city to visit, uh, and maybe the city that has like the worst fans? Because I've heard like obviously New York, Philly, and you guys you probably play yeah. in Philly, obviously. Um, Chicago White Sox, I heard are pretty bad. I don't know if you play there yet, but yeah. like, what is the place where you go? Where, like, those so fans favorite are place honest. to go would yeah. be San Diego. San Diego is awesome. It's Good fans, great stadium. City's unbelievable. I mean, weather is perfect. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. Um, I can't. I have nothing to, bad to say about that place. And I've pitched well there, which is, you know, obviously part of it too. I've loved pitching yeah. there. But um, San Francisco, their fans have been brutal to me. Um, oh man, Phillies are brutal. Dodgers for like as crazy of a fan base as they have, they're not bad. Like they're hmm. they they heckle you, but most of them are good baseball fans too, so they understand. Phillies ruthless though. Like I. I when I pitched there, it was like 
second series. So I had one inning and I gave up like three runs or something. So of course my ERA is like 50 something. And that's like the worst place to have that because you're warming up in the pen and that is all you're hearing the whole time. It's like 54. How do you even give up that many runs? And you're just like, oh my gosh. (laughs) But the bullpen, too, they're right on top of you. They, like, look down on you. Mm-hmm. So there's no getting away from them. Yeah. And, like, I've, I've heard fans in Philly, like, even the World Series, like, like there's videos and stuff of them just, you know, uh, chirping and stuff. What is maybe one funny chirp you've heard where you're like, all right, that's kind of that's kind of funny? Like, um, Well, there was one that wasn't for me, but Tyler Kinley, he's usually, like, stone cold. He doesn't yeah. listen to anybody. He can't hear fans. He's locked in. One guy in San Francisco, you know, everybody's yelling at him, whatever, maybe even cursing at him, who knows. And some guy goes, dude, how are you so pale? It's embarrassing. You're like Snow White. And he like stops to get off the mound and he's like, am I really that pale? Like, he what? asked a fan? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And the guy's like, yeah. And we're like looking at him we're like, yeah, you're kind of pale. And he's like, dude, for whatever reason, I did not expect that to come from a fan. He's like, you can say whatever you want. You can tell me yeah. I suck. My pitches are horrible. But he's like, I was not ready for that. That's insane. And like fans, you just got to, as a bullpen, you just got to kind of like brush it off. Can't let yeah, it bother you. Just, you just let it come in one ear and not the other. Nice. Um, so let's end on this. When you're not pitching, you talk about video games, um, you talk about golfing. What do you do? You talk about movies. Like, what do you do for fun? Like when, when you're not working out, what, like, what do you do to in- entertain yourself? Um, and keep yourself uh, I guess you know whatever you're not doing when you're what do you do when you're not pitching yeah so I I like video games are fun for me Um, I like to build PCs so that kind of goes with video games okay Um, and then I like to hunt I do a lot of hunting and Colorado is a pretty good state for the outdoors Mm -hmm. so do archery for big game and then I do uh, I do a lot of waterfowl hunting as well nice I've never been hunting like I grew up in California yeah um now in the bay area so it's like no one really hunts there no. um and now i'm in wisconsin where everybody hunts and i, I still haven't gone <laughs> that's all they do i still I'm haven't doing. gone but someday someday i'm someday. gonna go hunt. yeah no it's good it's good to learn it's fun to especially with the bow and arrow i'm not a big yeah. rifle hunting guy oh you, you you hunt with a bow yeah 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 i do for all my big game i use a bow and that's to me it's like a true like challenge and test yeah. and i love it it's kind of intimidating now i feel like and it is, hunting, it with, is. hunting with the bow like geez like that's uh yeah, especially primitive, you're chasing you know? these huge animals and all you got this little bow. Yeah. Jeez, wow. Well, hey, next time you're here in Milwaukee, like maybe we'll have to do a TikTok or something together and yeah. I'll come out here, yeah. we'll, we'll get to a game and uh well maybe I'll you know I'll chirp at you and see what, what your reactions are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. But uh there yeah, um, thanks for coming on, Lucas. I, I really appreciate it. Like I mean, like I said, a big fan of your work and your talk and stuff. Um, I'm a big Lucas fan now. Like if I see guys chirping on Twitter, like I got your back, I'm gonna be my uh, my Twitter account is basically your burner now. So yes. uh, anything coming that. from that, just assume it's from you. <laughs> I love that. Well, thank you so much. I had a blast.